Swayze. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast. Podcast. Where we talk about things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 33. This week, it's Daisy's turn to share something with us. Daisy, what do you have? Well, Terry, this is something I mentioned in last week's episode. And I've referenced it before, I believe. It's a book, actually, that I've been meaning to use for a long time now. It's literally a little book. The listeners at home won't see, but I'm holding it up for you to see. Literally quite a small book and quite a short and easy read. So although we don't usually talk about books and I didn't go looking for I'm sure there are podcasts where he talks about the book but it's actually quite a quick read and a good read that I that I would actually recommend that people go and read the book it is called the Kaizen way one small step can change your life so that's going to give you a bit of a clue if you don't remember already from me having referenced it it's by somebody called Robert Mora PhD. I first read a number of years ago. I can't remember how many years ago now. And it came back to mind as you've mentioned, and I've listened to them on podcasts, Atomic Habits, and I'm going to get it wrong again, because I can never remember whether it's small steps or tiny steps or tiny habits, I think, isn't it? Tiny habits. So Atomic Habits and Tiny Habits. And it always makes me think of this book, which I think probably came before both of those. And I'm actually going to split this probably into a couple of episodes because this first episode, I'm sort of going to talk about the basis, the history of where it comes from and whether all of these approaches come from the, the same principles or not. I don't know, but it it sounds... It sounds like they kind of do. I mean, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing earth shattering, is there, by breaking things down into small steps. But it kind of feels like this is one of the sort of the foundational pieces that they came from. And as I say, I found the history of it really quite interesting. So that's mainly what I'm going to talk about in this episode. Uh, Robert Mora is a UCLA clinical psychologist. He's a behavioral health instructor and he has a consulting firm called the Science of Excellence. And he consults to all sorts, industry, organizations, schools, hospitals, apparently even the British government. Now, he's very interested in strategies that people use to succeed, but then also use to stay successful. And he mentions in his introduction that most of psychology and medicine studies why people get sick or they don't function well and how to fix that. He's really interested in the opposite of quote unquote failure. And he really doesn't like how so much standard advice just doesn't take into account how hard most people find it to change. He talks about when people feel they need to change something, they usually turn to innovation as a strategy. And he defines this as in a business sense as a drastic process of change. It ideally happens fast and yields a dramatic turnaround. You can imagine that in, you know, how important that is in uh, for something like a, a failing business, for example. But it tends to be our approach when it comes to personal change too. And this drastic process of change, innovation, does have dramatic results, but it's not the only approach. And the tendency also with this kind of mindset is to ignore a problem and keep putting it off until that time when you'll make the big change, take the drastic steps. And this is certainly something that I've done. Uh, when it comes to, for example, changing my diet, I just put it off, put it off, put it off and, and carry on with all the things that actually, when you look back on it, there are all sorts of little interventions you could have taken, but you tend to put it off because you're thinking, well, I'll change all of it at once and I'll tackle it then. It says these big changes, this innovation type change can often work really well in the short term, but sustainability is an issue as that initial enthusiasm and momentum tends to wear off. 
And he talks about this big change, a radical change is like charging up a steep hill. You may run out of wind before you reach the crest or the thought of all the work ahead makes you give up no sooner than you've begun. And this is where Kaizen comes in. And apparently it came into being in depression era America. During Nazi occupation in World War II, American leaders realized how urgently European allies needed shipments of military equipment. And also they were becoming aware that it was going to be very likely that American soldiers would soon need to be deployed in Europe. And they realized they needed to step up the, both the quality and the quantity of the production of this military equipment. So the US government created management courses called Training Within Industries, TWI, and they offered them to US corporations to help them get up to speed for supplying both America and their allies. And one of these courses focused on what was called continuous improvement where supervisors were encouraged to look for hundreds of small things that they could improve. They had no time for big radical overhauls. So they looked instead for ways to improve existing jobs with the existing equipment and staff. And a real uh, vocal advocate for this strategy was someone called Dr. Edwards Deming. And he encouraged everyone everyone in an organization in these factories to find little ways to increase productivity and quality. And he put suggestion boxes on the factory floors and company executives were instructed that they had to treat every suggestion with respect and due consideration. So no suggestion that was put in the suggestion box could be ignored. This turned out to be a very, very successful strategy that ramped up American manufacturing considerably. This was then introduced to Japan after the war when General MacArthur's occupation forces helped rebuild the devastation. Surprisingly, considering Japan's reputation now, many of their post-war businesses were very poorly run with slack management and low employee morale. And boosting the Japanese economy was both in their interest and the US's interest. So they brought in these TWI specialists to help. And basically what happened is the Japanese loved the strategy so much, they took it and they ran with it. And it was them who gave it a name, Kaizen. Whereas ironically, in America, where it actually started, it was just pretty much ignored. Once all the, uh, when the US troops returned home and production went back to normal, they kind of forgot all about it. But the Japanese really, really took it and ran with it and, and became, uh, you know, developed the reputation that they have today for, for efficiency. So there are these two main strategies for change. Innovation, shocking and radical reform versus Kaizen, which the principle of it is to take small, comfortable steps towards improvement. So Robert Maurer, the author of the book, he first encountered Kaizen working with corporate clients, but he wanted to adopt it in his work as a psychologist to help people with personal and individual changes they wanted to make to their lives. And I mentioned an example in our episode last week about the woman that he asked to march on the spot for one minute a day in front of the television. And the thought had come to him when she'd come in and for health reasons, she needed to up her exercise. But he could see from just her general demeanor that saying that she needed to exercise more was not going to help. You know, the old eat less, move more was just going to be was not going to be well received and it was not going to work, which is why he suddenly thought, I'm going to try this. I'm going to ask her to march on the spot for one minute a day. Over time, he saw her and he watched her attitude change from the sort of the shock, I guess, from her expecting to be told that she had to do a lot of exercise every day to being told that all she had to do was this one minute of marching every day. And what happened was she started coming in and saying, well, what else can I do in a minute a day? And slowly together, 
they built change and moved towards the overall goal one small step at a time. And her initial resistance to impactful exercise and typical sort of routines that you would suggest started melting away. And she enthusiastically started on her own doing much longer workouts. So the main principle that comes out of this is to come up with small, comfortable steps in the right direction. And there are various different elements of Kaizen that he goes into that I want to talk about in a bit more detail in another episode. But I guess where I'm sort of starting from was just, like I say, I found it interesting hearing about where it came from, where it all started. But then to take the principle, instead of it being a big, uncomfortable change, is taking these small, comfortable steps in the right direction towards the goal you want to accomplish. And if you feel resistance, you just keep making it smaller until it feels almost silly. It's so easy. But it's just something, and again, this is what we talked about last week, something that you can commit to doing every day. Um, so I guess really it's almost a little bit of a teaser for talking about it in a bit more detail, but just to start thinking about things that you want to change, what is it you want to change and your homework, if you like, is to think of, instead of thinking about the big change, is to think what could that tiny little step be that you could commit to that you can start working towards the bigger goal. So Daisy, I have not read this book, but I have already looked it up and got it ready to be in my Amazon cart now that you're talking about it. But it reminds me of something, kind of another concept, and I don't know if he talks about it in the book, but it's this idea of motivation. And when you were talking about looking at a big task or a big goal, that it can seem kind of daunting. And it's really hard to feel motivated when you have this really big task ahead of you. Oftentimes, sometimes that can move people. But so I like this idea of by breaking it into really small steps, you build momentum and motivation builds through that momentum. So obviously, I don't know the second part of what you are going to share, but I'm just kind of excited by the idea of this way of building motivation, getting our momentum by starting small enough that it's not overwhelming until we feel the motivation. And, you know, the example that you used with that woman, she was motivated after she realized she could do the small steps. And so I think there's a lot of value to breaking things down like this into just doable pieces that don't bring up any friction for you until you can build it into the bigger tasks that maybe at first seem too big to accomplish. Yes, I think my main reason for sort of breaking it into two parts is that there is a lot more information in there that I want to talk about. And I guess the second part, if you like, are more of the suggestions, why it works and some suggestions for how to start choosing those steps and how to put them into practice. And I guess what I wanted people to think about was to kind of think about it a bit before hearing that bit, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So to get away from that, because I bet everybody pretty much has got some big picture ideas in their head of things they want to change in this coming year. I think it's almost impossible not to have that, but really to, to just take it down into like I say, almost the silliest of tiny steps. What is the tiniest possible step you could think about in the right direction? And when we come back to talk more in detail about some of the suggestions that he has, it'd be kind of fun, I thought, to sort of fit in what you were thinking mm -hmm. to sort of what he has to say about it. That was my sort of feeling with breaking it into two parts, making it a bit of a teaser. <laughs> Yeah, you've already got me thinking about a couple that I'd like to look at. And I already have an idea of one of them that I could break down into a small step. So I think this could be helpful in, in my approach to some things that I want to tackle in these coming months, habits I want to build, 
practices I want to make become natural to me. Yeah, so sorry to kind of dump a a teaser episode, really, for the first episode of the year and land you with some homework. But I thought it might be kind of nice to, to think about things and come up with your own challenges and we can revisit it in a couple of weeks. This is a book, actually, that I come back to every now and then and reread. And it's already got me thinking of a few things, actually, a few things that I've tried that I thought were relatively easy to commit to. I started an exercise routine that was only 10 minutes a day. And it did actually seem easy at the time, but I stopped doing it. So I'm already thinking of of different things like that. What's going to be the really stupidly easy step that I can take that will mean I can build back up to a commitment like that, but is something that I actually can commit to very easily every day that's achievable in a minute. Well, I will be interested in what we talk about when we come back to this. So on that teaser note, <laughs> have a great first week of the year. Bye, everybody. Bye.